All right, we are live here on the Meat Mafia podcast, joined today by an original OG carnivore, Amber Ahern. She's one of the early adopters, and we are really excited to have her on. Amber, how are you doing today? Doing great. Thank you so much for having me on. Well, we're really excited to have you on because we know you are early to the whole carnivore move- movement, so it'll be great to get your perspective. Um and I know we came across your work through a few po- podcasts and interviews, so just excited to have you on. Great, thank you. Yeah, I've been around around in this space for a long time. I've seen a lot of things. Yeah, Amber, you because I know on your Twitter you write that you've been experimenting with a carnivore, you know, high fat approach since two thousand and nine, but. I think, I feel like I remember listening to a podcast where you mentioned you've been doing it. You were on the ketogenic diet, like back in like 1997 or something like that, correct? Yeah, that's right. I started low carb in 97. I found, well, I was ready at that time because my previous diet wasn't working for me. And I found Mike Eads and Mary Dan Eads' book, Protein Power, Mm. which had just come out. And so that was really good timing for me because I was looking for something else and, um, um, th- their book is, to this day, I, I still think it's a great book. It's full of references and really interesting information. Mm. And, and Amber, what were some of the things that that pushed you towards, uh, you know, lower carb approach? I know for me, I had ulcerative colitis, so a carnivore diet pretty much effectively gave me my health back. Did you have any autoimmune issues or just, just curious kind of what pushed you in that direction in the 90s? Not that I know. It was ma- mainly um, actually just weight gain that I mm. was dealing with. I was also dealing with mental health or or psychiatric issues. I was already diagnosed with depression at that time, which later was re-diagnosed as bipolar type two, but Mm. I didn't really realize that there would be a connection between diet and that aspect of my health at that time, not until much later. Mm. Amber, how quickly when you started adopting this style of diet, did you start seeing some of the changes that really made you kind of buy into what you were doing? Do you mean carnivore? Yeah, carnivore or keto. I mean, I think that like in my personal experience, like doing keto led me to try a more carnivore based diet. So they kind of come hand in hand. Mm. Yeah, well, but in both cases, I I got health improvements in terms of weight loss, at least Mm -hmm. immediately. I know that some people don't see results immediately and it can be very frustrating and challenging, but I, I definitely did. Um, when I started, when I started a carnivore diet, I had been low carb already for like a dozen years and initially it had worked really well for me. And Mm -hmm. I don't really know why, if it had to do with pregnancies or age factors or, um, the antidepressant medications that I'd been on, but my weight had steadily climbed up and up and up and so I was really feeling in a in a bad place because everything that I had learned had taught me that what I was doing should be helping and it wasn't and so when I when I found the carnivore diet uh, I was really hopeful Uh, it was a small forum that I had found called zeroing in on health Mm. and a lot of people there had similar backgrounds to me either they had regained while still on low carb or they had stalled out while still on low carb Mm. and and then they had tried eliminating plants and had seen not only weight loss but a variety of different uh, improvements in health and so i decided to try it and the effects were essentially immediate for me like by immediate like almost within the first couple days of cutting out uh vegetables yeah, in the first week, I was losing like a pound every other day. Do you, uh, I know a lot of people attribute it to the elimination aspect of the diet where, you know, you're cutting out a lot of the processed foods, but there's also a lot of additions that come into play when you start talking about nutrient density and the quality of the food that you're putting in your body. Which, which one do you put more weight to? Um, if, uh, it's probably not all that fair of a question because it's, it's tough to tell sometimes, but if you had to pick one, which, which one would you say is probably the more impactful source of feeling better? Yeah, well, there's definitely two pillars of carnivore. There's what you don't eat and what you do eat. Yeah. <laughs> and I, if I had to choose just one, I mean, I think that 
you will get a lot of the benefits of carnivore simply from not eating. <laughs> um, but that's obviously unsustainable. You have to you have to get nutrition from somewhere eventually. Mm -hmm. And so the elimination is really important. Um, but the nutrition, I don't know, I can't pick one. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they go, I mean, they, they, they play off of each other. It's, and I think, um, yeah, it's hard, it's hard to even split hairs there. They're both so important. Well, let me put it this way. So before I went on the plant-free carnivore diet, I was already on a low carb diet and it was a good quality, low carb diet. I included meat, although definitely not to the same extent because there was a lot of other stuff on my plate. Um, but it wasn't like, I wasn't doing a lot of low carb products or mm -hmm. you know, special desserts and things like that, although that certainly made some appearance. But I was mostly eating salads and, you know, cruciferous vegetables and other low carb vegetables and some amount of meat. So the, the biggest change, I think, was what I was not eating because an, animal source foods were already definitely there. Mm -hmm. Got it. Amber, with with the research that you've done, you know, why why do you personally think that vegetables are harmful to so many people? You know, it really has taken me a long time and I don't think that we have a true answer like it hasn't it hasn't been shown to be the answer at first. Well, at first I thought this is crazy because everyone knows that vegetables are good for you. So I must be improving my health somehow in spite of the fact that I'm not eating vegetables and not because of it. Mm -hmm. And at some point fairly early on, I heard uh, Dr. Georgia Ede speak. She, it was a ancestral health symposium talk called, uh, uh, the name will come to me, but she was talking about anti-nutrients in plants and how they have to defend themselves in order to survive evolutionarily. Like any plant that is just gonna let itself be eaten isn't gonna make it to the next generation. Oh, it was called a uh, Little Shop of Horrors. <laughs> Shop of Horrors. <laughs> um, and it's kind of obvious in retrospect that that has to be the case, but it was the first time that I had heard that idea and it really struck me as, um, you know, possible explanation for why we would, why why plants could cause a health problem because they're mm. they're just chock full of these toxins and it's a little bit doesn't seem like a full answer because we all know lots of people who do eat plants and don't seem to have that problem, right? Mm -hmm. And plants have always been included in the human diet, sometimes very little amounts, mm -hmm. um, but sometimes more, and and there's also, if we're gonna talk about evolution, where humans are not herbivores, but eventually if you go back far enough, we descended from herbivores and all herbivores and omnivores have had to likewise keep up this arms race with, with uh, the biochemical warfare that's going on, right? So herbivores aren't gonna survive either if they can't eat the plants in the face of the toxins. So they're in, at the same time as plants are, are putting out toxins, herbivores are, are learning or, you know, evolutionarily learning defense mechanisms for that and the, the ability to detoxify. Mm -hmm. So, so what I think is that if many people right now are having trouble with plants um, in that when you take the plants away, they're a lot, they're doing a lot better. There must be or there could be some compromise in their ability to detoxify. And one of the, I think the more plausible points of vulnerability might be intestinal permeability. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely something that I felt too, Amber, when I was going down the carnivore rabbit hole, I was doing low carb for a while um, and I would eat the cruciferous vegetables, you know, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, spinach, et cetera. And I started, I mean, it's delicious, but I started noticing you know, I would keep a food journal. And I was like, every time I eat Brussels sprouts, like, I feel like I'm not sleeping super well. I can feel it in my stomach. And I started realizing these dark leafy greens just don't sit well. And then I, you know, stumbling upon your work and Dr. Baker's work. And I'm like, all right, well, why don't I just try pulling these things out? And I was just amazed just like having a pound of ribeye and just like the way that it would just digest incredibly well, my stomach, my skin cleared up. It was just like, 
it was, it was unbelievable. I know so many patients and clients that you work with, you know, attest to the same thing. It's, it's pretty incredible. Yeah. The digestive piece, it, it wasn't a, a large factor for me that I could tell. Mm -hmm. um, and so when people would suggest, oh, you have some kind of a gut problem, and that's why I kind of dismissed it out of hand. But, but in fact, maybe there are ways that your gut could be compromised without direct digestive problems um, showing up as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Amber, are there, for you in particular, are there like cuts of meat or food groups within the carnivore diet that have just, that have, they, that have done really well for you over the last decade or so that you've been, that you've been on this diet? I think that a lot of people who are on the carnivore diet for a long time tend to gravitate toward ruminant animals for whatever mm -hmm. reason. So beef mm -hmm. and lamb. I know some people who do really well on pork, other people who just really don't. I, I enjoy it all. I enjoy seafood and chicken, and I even like organ meats, but mm -hmm. I, I always feel my best if I'm including a lot of beef or lamb in my diet. Is there, in your research, <clears throat> I know there's certain aspects of meat that, you know, like vegetarians or vegans will talk about things that, you know, they have to supplement with because you can't get them from just uh, fruits and vegetables. What, what sort of things do, does meat offer that fruits and vegetables don't? Well, there's nothing that can't be gotten from some animal source. So we don't have the same problem that vegans have where, where technically they can't get any B12. And then um, less technically, the, the variety of foods that they eat might be def, um, not so much deficient, but low in nutrients that if they ate more of would probably support their health better. Mm. Um, but if we look at it in that softer kind of way, so there's a difference between saying, you know, what can be provided with some kind of animal source food and what would be provided if you ate a sort of typical carnivore diet. And those are different because, um, well, primarily because <laughs> if you want to hit all the RDAs, which I don't necessarily think that you do, but as a starting point, if you want to hit all the, all the RDAs, you kind of have to include liver in mm. your diet. And the fact is that a lot of people who are long-term carnivores and healthy haven't been including liver and they haven't come across any kinds of signs of deficiencies. And so that suggests to me that there are physiological things going on that change the levels of needed nutrients. Uh, there are lots of things that could contribute to that, including um, absorption problems that come with grain foods, for example, but also physiological things like um, how much iodine do you need depends on how much thyroid you're using and how much thyroid you're using depends on how much carbohydrate you're metabolizing. And so it's quite plausible that your iodine needs would be less. And then there are other, other things like uh, sparing effects. And this is really important for vitamin C, which is the big question in carnivore when you first come across it like okay i can see how you might get vitamin a and i can see how you're going to get your b vitamins but how are you going to get your vitamin c um the truth is meat contains vitamin c even though that's that's sort of obscured because the usda database says that it doesn't and you have to look really closely to note that they they actually didn't measure it <laughs> like they, there's a zero with a little footnote <laughs> yeah <laughs> um but it still doesn't have a lot, but what it does have a lot of is carnitine and carnitine spares vitamin C because vitamin C is necessary to make carnitine. And so there, there are all these different ways in which the, the, the entire composition of your diet is affecting your nutrient needs that make that puts someone who is both on a ketogenic metabolism, which a carnivore would be, and not eating all these other um, things that are common in the diet in which the RDAs were developed, in which we would differ, and sometimes I think in really important ways. Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And something that you also just reminded me of, remember when I was going on your website, I love how the banner says, eat meat, not too little, mostly fat. And it reminded me of, I remember the first time I heard about Stephenson's experiment where he ate meat for an entire year. Uh, one of the important things that I think was overlooked is that 
I think during that year, right, he, I maybe, I think he got sick once him and his partner got sick once and they found that they were, the meat that they were eating was very lean. And then they started supplement, they started incorporating fattier cuts of meat, a lot more saturated fat, and they instantly started to feel better. So is that, is that part of your methodology too, that if people are going to go carnivore, be very intentional about the saturated fat that they're consuming and going for some of these fattier cuts? Yeah. Well, what happened with Stephenson is that he said at the outset, you have Mm -hmm. to give me fatty meat or I'm going to, it's not going to work. And they, Mm -hmm. so they said, okay, well, let's try leaner meat. And lo and behold, yes, he got sick. And I I think that, so there were two people in that experiment, his co uh, co co-explorer, Karsten Anderson. And I think they only did the lean meat with one of them and not the Mm -hmm. other. Um, (laughs) And then from then on, they'd let them eat ad libitum where they weren't restricting Mm -hmm. the fat and the way that it fell out was that they were eating about 80 percent fat which is pretty Mm -hmm. much the high end i think that if if you were to survey carnivores in the in just um our modern world who are doing this it would fall somewhere between 65 and 80 percent fat but Mm -hmm. a lot of i i think the the healthier and leaner you are the more that starts to go toward higher fat and the longer the longer you're on it because lean 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 just isn't sustainable Mm -hmm. you're you're gonna have signs of energy deficiency and i think that a lot of people even on on keto run into this problem and they think that it's a problem with keto they i've heard people say oh women shouldn't do this because i've worked with women and they all get these signs of and they say signs of hypothyroid but it's not really signs of hypothyroid it's signs of under eating like Mm -hmm. they might even lose their periods or they, they just feel lethargic they get irritability all those things go away when you have enough fat in your diet and and i think people especially if you come at it from the way I did, where your main concern was to lose weight, um, if it's vanity perspective, because we have this whole idea that the way to lose weight is to reduce calories and restrict calories, ketogenic diet already gives you a bit more appetite control. And so you think, yeah, I'm gonna eat this way. And look, I'm not as hungry. I'm gonna eat just a little bit less and just a little bit mm. less and a little bit less fat. And when you do that, it, it doesn't end well. Mm. It's important. Yeah, I was I was curious too. Um, you know, from a female perspective, is there anything that women need to be mindful of of exploring a carnivore, higher fat diet versus a versus a men's perspective? I don't think so. I mean, women carry a lot more fat, and their bodies kind of are are expecting to need to support additional life at any time, at least during the first phase of adult mm-hmm. life. Um, so for women of reproductive age, there, there's just, um, a higher demand, I think, for nutrients and for energy in general, but, but I don't think they need to do anything special. One, I think one thing that, that you start to learn when you're on a carnivore diet for a little while is to actually be able to trust your appetite. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense in a world where you're eating all these engineered foods and even things like spices that sort of um, derail or interfere with your palate. There's, there seems to be, and it, I used to think this was kind of weird woo woo, but, but Mm. actually when you think about it, other animals know what to eat, what to avoid, and, and they gravitate toward what they need. And so it makes sense that humans would have this ability too. but almost nobody that I know has had any experience with what they desire to eat, having anything to do with something that's good for them, especially because of all these engineered foods and, and even just sugar and spices that get in the way of being able to taste what you need. But once, you remove all of those things a lot of people are finding that um when they're on a carnivore diet like sometimes they'll just feel like having more fat and and so they do and sometimes they feel like having liver and so they do and and i think that there's probably actually good reasons for those once you've removed those um things that get in the way Hmm. is is there um when people are starting this diet 
is there like one or two things that you would recommend for them to keep in mind? I know for me, like salt was definitely one thing that I needed to be mindful of because as soon as my sodium levels dipped, I would feel a little bit uh, angsty or, or not, not uh, didn't have as much energy. Um, so and I know water retention is one thing that is probably also another factor there that also plays another sodium. Is there anything that you would try to advise people to keep in mind as they're trying more of a low carb, high fat approach? Um, yes. So eating enough is one thing. Um, not drinking too much is also something to be mindful of because whenever you're in a ketogenic state, you're generating so much metabolic water and you also, um, need less water to excrete urea. Um, so your water needs are actually a lot less. And if you drink a lot of water, then you're going to need salt. And I, I'm actually preparing a, a uh, presentation for the Ancestral Health Symposium this year, mm. arguing that, uh, that the high salt that's being recommended in the ketogenic community lately um, is actually not evolutionarily consistent. And mm. a lot of carnivores are finding that when they drop the salt, they, they actually feel better. Now, not everyone. I know that some people seem to have increased salt needs. I don't know why, but as a general pattern, I'm seeing that a lot of people in the carnivore community, myself included, because when I started, there was no, eating salt was not a recommendation by anyone except for during keto adaptation and, and only then. Mm -hmm. And the idea that at least the way I heard it, I don't know if it was said exactly specifically, but was, if you're going to try this diet, don't eat any seasonings. And so I didn't eat any salt, either because that was what was being said or because I didn't know any better. In fact, Stephenson and the bear both were against salt. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's just the way I've always done it. And it took a little while. It was kind of bland for the first couple of weeks, but I got used to it. And now, now when I taste anything salty, even bacon, I just can't eat very much of it. Mm -hmm. So then you fast forward to now where um, um, there are certain people who have been really advocating for high salt. And in some cases, I do think it's warranted. Um, so a lot of people who are starting carnivore diets are starting with this uh, meat, salt, water thing. And I think if you reduce the water, you can, re you can also reduce the salt. Mm -hmm. uh, some people are seeing improvements with that. Mm -hmm. It might be worth it too, because uh, Harry and I have talked about this. Maybe even if you're if you're going to start a diet, to take it to the next level and get some type of like a sweat test or just like understand what your baseline sodium levels are. Just like like I I personally have not done that. Like I'm pretty confident that I'm a salty sweater, um, and I do feel good when I have more sodium. But at the same time, it's like that's just an intuitive thing that I think. I don't know for sure because I've never actually taken the time to get that done. I'm totally open to the idea that there's a lot of variability there. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I've learned that there's a lot of variability across a lot of things. I don't know about the sweat test because one thing that I'm pretty sure happens is that so um, the more sodium you take in, the more mm. you will expel that way. So hard to say if, if how much you will learn just by mm. that measure. Yeah. Amber, how do you factor in activity level when you start thinking about this topic in particular? Yeah, a lot of people, um, a lot of people who are athletic say that they need more salt, and we can certainly uh, make a, a, a story that sounds reasonable about the sweat. Um, but not everyone. I know that there are people who are quite athletic and still feel better without the high salt. And I, I do think it might have it might come back to the water intake thing, but I'm not sure. Mm. But yeah. no, um, Rob Wolf, for example, has very um, articulately explained how some some people that he works with who are doing very athletic things just feel like crap if they're on low salt, even though the evolutionary picture looks like that should be the way it is. But he, neither he nor I would be one to say, try to match evolution when it makes you feel crappy, right? Yeah. right. <laughs> So it does seem like the, one of the important things with, with the approach that you're talking about is to have that like almost intuitive sense of like, you know, check in internally with your body. Do you feel good? 
Um, is that, is that something you think a lot about, or maybe even like keeping a food journal just to like document your energy levels, your symptoms, things like that? I think food journals are really underrated. Um, mm -hmm. They're a pain. Um, yeah. I'm actually really bad at it. <laughs> I, I often will get to this point where I say, shoot, what was I doing three weeks ago? <laughs> I have no idea. Um, and then I'll start writing things down and then I'll lose the habit. So I'm, I'm probably not the best model for that. But uh, my friend Siobhan Huggins and her coworker Dave Feldman are absolutely the best mm -hmm. record keepers. They are a great inspiration for that. And, and one thing that I learned from them is you, you don't have to make detailed notes or graphs or anything that one of the tools that they use is just to take a photograph of what they're eating every day. It's all right there in the picture. If you never need to look at it again, fine. But if you want to, it's there. Mm. Yeah. And speaking of Dave Feldman, um, what's interesting is that you, I think you mentioned that you have a, you have a background as a computer scientist and he, he's actually, I think he's a software engineer by trade. Yeah. Um, do you ever just think about, you know, maybe how, you not coming from a medical background and approaching things from a computer scientist background has maybe helped you just like think about nutrition and diet differently than maybe some other people in the space? Yeah, I think that um, in the medical academic world, authority is a really um, big tradition. Mm -hmm. There's not as much of the kind of questioning that you would see in other sciences, for example. And um, I think that's that's a shame. I understand where it came from because there's a kind of, in, especially in the medical military history, you're faced with emergencies and there's no time for just, you know, sitting in your chair and thinking about it. You need someone to say, we're going to do this. And I, I believe that that has contributed to that tradition. And I definitely came from a tradition where you have to test everything um, and things have to pass logic, <laughs> like first and foremost. <laughs> and if you if you read a lot of medical literature, you can see that a lot of people just really, uh, it's really obvious that they have this idea of how, what they're trying to show. Uh, well, we all do, right? Um, we all are looking to support our own biases. That's just the way the brain works. Um, I think actually, I've begun to think that the best way to fight bias isn't so much by learning to try to refute your own hypotheses, although that's a really great trait if you can do it, <laughs> but by actually looking at science as a collaborative activity. So I'm gonna be a really good critic for people who have a vegetarian bias and present their studies, and yeah. they're, they're going to be a really great critic for me. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I do think that it's not a coincidence that some of the um, more insightful people who have started thinking about diet have come out, come from outside of the medical nutrition community. Mm. Amber, one of the common critiques of this uh, high meat diet is the cholesterol topic. What about cholesterol is, is basically all you hear when you start telling people that you're on a, a meat only diet. Uh, was that something that you were thinking about early on when you adopted this? And what have you come to learn about that topic in particular? Well, I was already persuaded through reading literature when I was in low carb mm. that LDL cholesterol was not a great marker for heart disease. That's the thing we're worried about when we talk about cholesterol, right? Um, and there are other markers of heart disease that are more uh, more tightly correlated, such as triglycerides and HDL, and those become favorable on a low carbohydrate diet. So, so I've never actually really worried about cholesterol. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's cavalier of me, but you know, cholesterol, high cholesterol is, is associated with longer, with longer life and it, it has an immune role. And I'm, I'm just not persuaded that, that LDL is causal for, uh, for heart disease and for um, atherosclerotic plaques. Hmm. Yeah, we, we had on um, Dr. Philovadia and in his, in, in his book, Stay Off My Operating Table, he actually says that 
the single best predictor of your metabolic health is, um, is the size of your waist, which we thought was incredibly interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, that would be visceral fat as a Mm -hmm. proxy for visceral fat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, visceral fat again, and it's kind of similar to cholesterol in that it's, it has an immune function. So if your visceral fat is going up, yeah, that's a high risk factor, but it's not that the visceral fat is bad. It's that the visceral fat is needing to protect you for some reason. It's an indicator that something else is going wrong. Mm. Amber, what are some of the other common critiques that you hear about the carnivore diet that um, you, you find yourself constantly having to defend? Uh, so we've already touched on the nutritional content and cholesterol. There's the fiber thing. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, anyone who's had a digestive disorder is going to tell you that fiber is not all it's cut out to be. (laughs) Um, The idea that you would need to eat a lot of plant fiber to have healthy bowels, even when you don't, even without looking at studies, which don't support that, (laughs) um, you can just think about, for example, the fact that there are many mammals in the world and many of them are carnivorous and mm. they all have perfectly intact colons. Colons in a, or, or not just colon, but the whole digestive tract, the, the digestive tract of, of, a, of any mammal has, has differences in terms of what parts are there. But if we're just talking about the tissue health, there's no problem with the tissue health of a carnivorous animal. And so the idea that you need fiber to feed it is a, is a little bit of a non-starter already. And then, so the, I think there have been different ideas that have come in and out of fashion. Like um, one of the early ideas was that you need fiber in order to control your glucose levels. Well, <laughs> if you're not eating glucose in the first place, it, it doesn't really matter whether that's accompanied by fiber. Um, and then more recently, there's been um, talk about the the short chain fatty acids that are produced by bacteria that will eat that fiber and mm. the importance of, in particular, butyrate. And butyrate is important for for the health of the intestinal tissues, but plant fiber isn't the only source of it. Uh, there was an early experiment where they took dogs and they gave them a, a, a high plant diet and they gave them an, a plant-free diet. And the amount of butyrate that they appeared to be producing was the same, actually. Mm. Um, and there are different components that can come into that. So there's a, there's a bacteria, Ackermansia, which mm. lives uh, very close to the lining of the gut, and it actually produces butyrate and it goes up in ketogenic conditions. So, so I, I don't think that any, I haven't seen any argument so far that the absence of fiber in the diet would necessarily lead to health problems. Mm. Speaking of the bacteria, Amber, I know that something that Ogenes von der Planets spent a lot of time speaking about was how we have these almost like overly sterilized guts based off of the food we're eating, the antibiotics we take, the way that we approach Western medicine. And I think that was part of his reason for incorporating a lot of raw meat into his diet, um, raw dairy, raw eggs, think products like that. Do you feel a particular way on that? Do you think there's value to maybe incorporating some raw types of meat? Just just curious your thoughts there. Well, I haven't seen that particular argument. So just to make sure I'm understanding it correctly, is he saying that if you're eating it raw, that means that it's coming with accompanying bacteria? Exactly. Repopulate? Exactly. That's that's an interesting idea. Um, I have mixed feelings about raw. I I definitely think that there are some nutrients that are less available, um, they're they're destroyed ultimately by cooking. So I think that if you're eating, so for example, vitamin C, you can still get that if you're eating, I think even up to medium, Mm -hmm. but you don't wanna completely cook it out or you will get scurvy eventually. (laughs) Uh, And there are other things like, amino acids like tor- taurine for example which is susceptible to cooking um, raw foods are delicious um, they keep the fat matrix in better 
in terms of ground beef, I do not like cooked ground beef because the the way that the way the ground beef is the the fat is is right there and so when you cook it it immediately renders out and you're left with bits of dry hard protein with with rendered swimming and rendered fat but i i absolutely love raw, raw ground beef but on the other hand um there are there is a danger of dangerous bacteria especially mm. you know you mentioned about the gut being uh, maybe more vulnerable in terms of having been uh, clean <laughs> with the antibiotics or whatever um and that makes you more vulnerable to to pathogens and yeah. i myself have had a, a a terrible ordeal of an experience where i had um i had antibiotics and i had um, multiple infections each one getting worse and then having more antibiotics and this went on for actually a couple of years and i'm still recovering from it and i think that it's partly due to the fact that I like to incorporate raw foods. And there was a point where there might've been a high pathogen and I was vulnerable. So I'm never gonna probably stop eating raw foods completely because I really enjoy them, but I feel a little bit more cautious about them than I initially did. Mm. Go ahead, Brett. No, I was, no, I, um... I literally had a, oh, I was, I forgot I was going to say for a second, but I, I, this is purely anecdotal, Amber, but I've noticed with myself that I definitely do not digest cooked ground beef nearly as well as I do steak. Do you find that, is that similar for yourself or any other clients or patients that you, that you've worked with before? Yes. And I think that actually has to do with the fat because rendered fat is just harder to digest than, than fat that's still within that sort of collagen matrix that's holding okay. it together. I, so at, consequent to those infections that I had for a while, I had developed pretty severe fat malabsorption and I could not eat um, rendered fat, uh, but raw fat <laughs> or even just fat in, in steak where it hasn't rendered out, it is much, much easier for me to digest. And I think that's pretty common. Okay, that's yeah. helpful. Amber, one of the, we had Dr. Kate Shanahan on recently, and one of her pillars is talking about fermented foods and how those are a, a very important part of some of the historically more healthy societies um, in human civilization. Is that something that you're incorporating in your diet? Like whether it's through some fermented dairy or um, other sources of fermented foods? Um, sometimes I do eat fermented dairy. I have not tried high meat yet, although it's on my list of things to try. Um, at one point early on in my carnivore experiences, I came across the GAPS diet, mm -hmm. which you may or may not be familiar with, but it's like a series of steps to gut health. And it starts with you make, basically you cook bones with meat on them. And at first you just drink the, the, the broth off of that. Mm -hmm. And then after you do that, uh, you add the meat that's been cooked along with it. And then the next step is to start adding ferments. And so I tried adding sauerkraut and I had immediate terrible symptoms like brain fog. And um, it could have to do with a histamine sensitivity. It could have to do with the vegetables themselves. I'm not sure. But um, I, you know, it's interesting with fermented foods, the way I kind of think about it is, you know, through our evolution, we went from an animal that had this huge fermentation vat in our own digestive system to mm -hmm. one that did not. Uh, we just have a very small ability to do any fermentation. And so it's like we made this gut on the outside <laughs> where mm -hmm. we're like outsourcing the fermentation that used to happen in our gut. And I think that if you're going to eat vegetables, um, that might be actually a lot more important because it, it gives your gut the right kind of population to deal with the kind of food that's incoming. But if you're not eating those foods in the first place, I'm less convinced that you need to populate your gut in that particular way. Mm -hmm. Have you found bone broth to be to be helpful for you? Is that something that you regularly incorporate? I go in and out of phases with it. I really mm -hmm. like it. Um, when I was at my very healthiest before this infection, I was actually drinking a lot just um, 
in part because it became a really nice source of fat because I would use very fatty bones or like oxtail or something like that and then it would like you'd see this cup maybe this big and the top inch or two would be just fat and then I would emulsify it like with a hand blender just like it, if it were bulletproof coffee or something yeah. and it, <laughs> that was one of my favorite drinks um and and funny uh we talked about salt I find all of my food is pretty palatable without salt, but I, I really like salt in my bone broth. And that might have to do with the fact that it's fluid. I don't know. Um, so the answer is yes, I like it. I haven't noticed any particular health benefit with or without it, but sometimes, sometimes I just want it. And maybe that goes back to my body telling me there's something there. Mm. A, a little bit of grass fed butter in the bone broth with some salt is mm, incredible. Yeah. So, that it, sounds good. Yeah, no, we, I'm we, having for lunch. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, you at least got something out of this podcast. You know, it's your lunch now. <laughs> um, but we, we both anecdotally noticed, um, like if we ever go off of our diet, expect, especially with my colitis, I've just noticed if I go off the diet for the next 24 hours. I pretty much pay the price, but I'll, I'll incorporate like two to three cups of bone broth the next day. And I swear my there's something about my gut it almost feels like it repairs itself and it's like it gets me back on track every time um so that's why i was just curious how regularly you incorporate it yeah well it does have like glycine and collagen and mm -hmm. proline so it makes sense that it could be helpful mm -hmm. that's that's a good I, tip i was just about to ask you about collagen uh i think it's a, a really important part of uh the diet and i i think it's becoming popularized through supplementation. I see all these collagen peptides now. Um, how do you incorporate collagen into your diet? Because um, obviously, if you're just eating like ribeyes, which I think a lot of people think that's what carnivore is, you're probably not getting a whole lot of collagen, but there's obviously a bunch of different ways to get it. Well, actually, you are because all of the meat has like a collagen matrix mm. in it. Some cuts will have more than others. So like a, a jowl cut or, or um, um, what else is really collagen-y? I don't know. You can, you can tell if you, if it has that really silky mouthfeel, some of, some of the meats that are better done in the crock pot are like that. Um, but even just a ribeye, because on a carnivore diet, you're eating so much meat, it actually adds up. I did a calculation once and I don't remember off the top of my head, but I, I looked at like a collagen supplement and the amount that they recommended and then calculated how much was in two pounds of ribeye. And it was like, you are, you're already there. Yeah. <laughs> I'll see if I can dig that up. Hopefully I haven't exaggerated. <laughs> that would actually probably be a really interesting Twitter post. Yeah. Amber, one of the things I was curious about, we talked about how, you know, maybe there's this difference between how men and women should think about the carnivore diet. What about like kids? Is there anything that you would think about for young kids if you were trying to get them to eat more animal based? Yeah, what you feed your kids is kind of a litmus test of what you really believe, right? Because I'm willing to do a lot of things to myself that I wouldn't try on my children because my priority is keeping them safe. So uh, I think it can be really telling <laughs> what people do, but um, I don't, you know, I think children, there are children in the world in previous um, civilizations that have been on diets that were very low in plants and that they were very robust. Uh, but of course, we, we don't want to take as many risks with children as we're willing to do with adults because of things like they're, they're still growing, <laughs> their brains are growing, and we want to make sure that they get absolutely everything. So what I would say to a parent is um, go with your gut instinct because you'll never forgive yourself if something goes wrong, right? Um, and, you know, whatever you, whatever you think is necessary. But I think it's, I think it's important to include make sure that they're getting um well not everyone can eat dairy but dairy can be such a great um, um source of a lot of nutrients that are harder to get like calcium and vitamin k mm. um and i don't know maybe your question was asking more about encouraging them to eat animal source foods uh, children can get really locked into the way that they're used to and be resistant to change but 
if if you're setting a, a good example and you're showing them what you like to eat i know maybe this is just my personality i was a real people pleaser but i know that what really worked well on me when i was a child was um, to watch what my parents enjoyed because i wanted to be mature and grown up and act like them <laughs> yeah yeah is it um is it scary for you when you see cities like New York City that are pushing meatless Mondays and, you know, plant vegan Fridays and things like that on, on onto elementary school children? Yeah, I mean, it it's so misguided and I feel like they probably or at least most of the people involved have really good intentions, but it's really frustrating because I have a very different idea of what kind of effect that would have. And especially we're talking, so if you're talking about um, a school where they're providing lunches, mm -hmm. the children who are gonna be most likely to rely on those lunches are the ones that are probably getting the least high quality diet at home for reasons mm -hmm. of finances. And so I think it's disproportionately hurting poor people. Mm. So it, it's, yeah, I don't know what to do about that. Yeah. Mm. yeah it's Amber, uh, right, go ahead. Not to bounce around too much, but one of the things I was interested in learning about from you was this concept of uh, nutrient, nutrient absorption and how meats tend to, you know, if you're reading the label, your body is able to absorb a, a higher percentage of a lot of those macronutrients and, and minerals and, and vitamins, as, as you would compare it to a, a vegetarian diet. Is that something that you've come across in your research and um, your experience? Absolutely. And for different reasons. So often we have forms of the vitamin that are more bioavailable in meat than plants. So that would be true of, for example, iron and vitamin A and um, essential fatty acids. But then there's also the fact that grains and legumes, which are the basis of a, a more plant-based diet, actively interfere with absorption. So things like zinc are gonna be drastically affected by whether you're in, whether like what else you're including so you look at the label and it says you're getting this much zinc but that you're only going to get it <laughs> if the rest of your diet is set up in a certain way and yeah. then um i know i had a third way um yeah i don't remember right now it'll but, come it'll but, come to you yeah, it'll come back <laughs> <laughs> no that's great I, and i feel like i it's Clemenza, I know we've talked about this too. It's like probably the last couple of months. I, I I always was just blanket looking at things from, and most people do this. I think they, you just purely look at just grams of protein that you're taking in yeah. and most people don't even understand the concept of bioavailability. You know, what is your body actually able to absorb? How much of that protein are you taking in? And that's where I think animal based diets work so well for so many people, because you literally can feel it. Like your body is actually able to absorb and process what it's eating. Right. I I also feel like it's one of the myths of supplementation where it's not, you're not getting it in a balanced form. So the minerals that you would get in a lot of ways that are full and um, complement each other, um, they, they are inter interconnected and playing their roles. So if you're just eating like your highly, highly concentrated protein powder, you're probably not absorbing as much as you think you are. Yeah, I remembered my third point. It was about fat. So some of the mm. vitamins are, are fat soluble. And if you're eating them without that, they're not going to incorporate. And the the whole protein thing is really is really frustrating because protein is not one thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> so mm. if you if you if you don't have a fat, uh, sorry, a, an amino acid profile that looks essentially close to what you would find in meat, then um, the, use of, the use of the amino acids tends to be in our body um, in those kinds of proportions. And so if you get a protein source that's really high in some odd one, uh, but lower in some of the other ones, the protein amount might look the same, but as, as far as your body is concerned, it's you're you're limited by the one that is lower. It's almost like have you seen the idea of um, a barrel with staves, and so the you're you can't fill the barrel any higher than the lowest part on it because it's going to spill out mm -hmm. there. 
mm. uh, and protein pro, amino acid profiles of protein is very much that kind of model. Mm. That's fascinating. Something that you touched on before, I know you mentioned um, Rob Wolf. We, we both admire him. He's actually coming on the podcast in a few weeks. I, I was very interested um, when I read Sacred Cow, which he co-wrote with Diana Rogers, that they actually touch on the grain fed versus grass fed argument. And they basically say that, like, look, we wish that we can prove that grass fed is, is in some way nutritionally superior, but the data actually does not tell that story at all. Um, is that something that you've come across in your research or feel a particular way about grass fed versus grain fed? Because I'm sure you get asked about that all the time. Yeah, no, that's that's consistent with what I've read as well. So there are some nutritional differences, but they're really quite minor. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes they're portrayed in these percentages like, oh, look at the balance of linoleic acid to to omega three fatty acids. And it's it's so much better in in grass fed beef. Yeah, that's true. But the amount of polyunsaturated fats in total in in beef is so small that it, it really doesn't make that that big a difference. And the other thing is simply that most of the people that I know that have succeeded on a carnivore diet didn't for whatever reason, probably because of their means, were not able to make this a completely grass fed diet. And it didn't matter in terms of getting them, getting their goals, their health goals met. And I think it, there's a real danger when we're talking about the, um, health benefits of meat, if we if we say that it has to be grass fed, and there are reasons why you would want grass fed, and I think humane reasons might be among those. Um, but if you say you have to eat grass fed in order to get these benefits, you've just shut out most of the people who need this help the most, and mm. it's just not even necessary. Mm. Yeah, one of, one of the things we're big on is self-experimentation and we think that, you know, people should be trying to optimize and figure out what's best for them. If you were to give some actionable advice to people on how to get started, how to start making some of these changes, where would you, where would you lead them to, whether it's resources or just actionable steps for them to take uh, to get started? I am also a big advocate for trying things yourself and not just believing what you hear. And even if you see something in a study, that study is representing an average and not necessarily you. Um, so I, there people have different ways of approaching how to change, make big changes in their lives. Some people do really well making gradual changes. So they might cut out one thing and then cut out another thing and, and gradually get to um, something that looks like carnivore. Um, but other people, and, and I'm more like this, are a kind of all or nothing person where it's like, I'm gonna just completely do this for a good few weeks and see what happens. And, and only then will I add back some things and see see if uh, if I really needed to do that drastic a change. Uh, so there's some <laughs> there's some personalization in which which method appeals to you. But I think I'm going to argue a little bit for the elimination, the total cold turkey or hot steak way of doing it, because um, there are just so many different factors that you can you could you could easily not find out what it would feel like to be on a carnivore diet if you take it really slowly. Um, I have a story about a friend, and it's not a carnivore story per se, but his he had a child who was having difficulties and they suspected there was a food intolerance problem. And so they tried eliminating soy and that didn't make any difference. And they tried eliminating dairy and that didn't make any difference. And it turned out that he had intolerances to both. And it wasn't until much later they took them both out and got the results that they needed. And they would have, they missed that by doing it one at a time. Very interesting. Yeah. And, and to that point, um, one of the things that you, you had touched on early on is that I think you had mentioned some of the mental health benefits that you would notice in, the, in this transition from low carb to carnivore. Um, are you are you seeing a trend? I, I forget who I was listening to. It might have been Dr. Baker or it might have been someone else was mentioning that 
they're starting to hear more about the mental health benefits of going to carnivore, even compared to the physical benefits, weight loss, et cetera. Um, is that consistent with what you're seeing too, Amber? I mean, that's why I'm here. <laughs> so I told you about how I started the carnivore diet and I had these like great weight loss benefits and that was all well and good and motivating. But what what ultimately happened is that it put my my adulthood long psychiatric disorder into remission. I've been off psychiatric meds since 2009 and um, I've had moods, but I, I have never uh, wound up needing to be on psychiatric meds again. And that's just an absolute miracle because before I went to the carnivore diet, I was on a low carb diet. So I was already getting benefits of ketosis. I was already getting lots of benefits from that way of eating, but my bipolar disorder was progressing. It was getting worse. Mm. Amber, what do, you, what do you attribute that to? <laughs> I wish I knew. <laughs> <laughs> There's some idea that maybe um, if we follow down the road of intestinal permeability, uh, the, the permeability of different tissues is actually all connected. So if you have intestinal permeability, there's some chance that that biologically you're also going to have permeability in the blood-brain barrier. So maybe maybe it could be that. Maybe it could be just generalized inflammation has gone down and, and that has contributed. Um, the, the thing that was really mysterious to me in the beginning was, you know, I had been studying the benefits of ketogenesis for a really long time. And when mm. I went from a low carb diet to a carnivore diet, while I was still in ketosis, it was actually technically quite a bit lower amount of ketosis. And yet the, the benefit was more. So I knew it couldn't be completely down to ketosis. And that's why, um, Later, at some point, I tried to do a, a study on um, the difference between low carb and carnivore, and actually I had a big technical fail. Um, so I was specifically wanting to ask people to fill out a survey in which, so the condition was you were on a low carb diet for at least a certain amount of time, and you've been on a carnivore diet for at least a certain amount of time. and the questions were asking about conditions that you still had while low carb that improved or changed or didn't didn't change on carnivore. And um, it turned out that my my survey on certain um, platforms didn't show the questions properly and I had to throw out a whole bunch of the data uh, and I only ended up with 36 people. But of those 36 people, there was still this really strong effect where there are all these things, including skin issues, autoimmune-like issues, mood issues, energy, um, and then of course, like the whole, even the whole insulin resistance type thing, like weight and blood sugars and stuff like that. And And in almost every case, there was a huge improvement across the board. So it's, it's certainly not just ketosis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even going back to what you were talking about, about um, you know, this this shift in, in what you were eating, literally curing this this battle with with bipolar disorder and all these mental health symptoms that people that that people battle, like something we hear a lot about, and I'm sure you do too, is oh, you know, carnivore is too expensive for me. I can't be paying, you know, 15, 20 bucks for ribeye. It's like Number one, it's not more expensive because you're cutting out all the processed food and there's so many awesome budget cuts of meat that you can be incorporating and working in to make it to make it fit for you. And secondly, like what is the what is the price of not having to be on medication or psychiatric drugs? I would imagine that's probably a priceless investment for you. Um, so I don't know why we don't look at these things like holistic assets or just it's like they it's almost like being able to change your diet. It's like the gift that keeps on giving. Like a lot of our, you know, the reason why our podcast is even in existence is because we both had this experience with an animal-based diet. I had a six-year battle with ulcerative colitis, completely cured it up, got off all medication. Harry lost a bunch of weight in the, in the middle of COVID, um, switching to an animal-based diet. And it's like, it gives you, it gives you confidence. And it's like a, it's like this baseline pillar that just builds and, and affects the other areas of your life incredibly positively. Yeah, um, and meat is is cheaper than 
vegetables because mm. vegetables are mostly water. So per calorie, they're actually really expensive, but it's not cheaper than grain. And if you, if you're, if you're really poor, you might say, theoretically, I would like to protect my health and eat cheaper, but it, it, you may not be able to do it in practice if you're, if you're at the level where you definitely have to eat mm. grains. But even then, there are things you can do to um, make it cheaper if you really want to. So eggs and ground beef and pork and chicken are, are all legit animal foods that are, that are going to help you. You don't have to be eating even beef. You don't certainly don't have to be eating ribeye, although it sure is good. <laughs> <laughs> Amber, do you, do you get involved with any of the environmental discussions when people start talking about beef being or cows being bad for the environment? I do sometimes. It's not totally my expertise, but there are certain fallacies that I see coming up again and again, like um, comparing um, comparing calories that you could get if you just fed like soy or something directly to humans, I think is a really bad comparison because um, cattle are are eating mostly things that humans can't eat. So like, I think 85 at least percent of their diet is not competitive with with humans. So it's just a pure win if you can if you can give them a small amount of food that maybe you could have eaten and then a whole bunch of other food that you couldn't possibly have eaten and then you get this thing that is nutritionally superior. And then when they talk about calories, I think I, I haven't been able to find all the sources but it is my suspicion that they're completely throwing away the fat and they're just talking about protein. It, there's so much fat thrown away. Mm -hmm. it, it blows my mind. If you go to the grocery store and say, can you save me some beef trimmings? Uh, they're throwing them away otherwise. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that that's happening at every step of the processing as well. Um, so that's just, that's criminal when we, when we have, you know, people who aren't getting enough energy. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Speaking of beef trimmings, um, are you, are you a fan of, I know you spoke about the rendered fat before. Do, does that mean, will you, do you like tallow? Do you not like tallow? What are your, what do you like to cook your meat in? I love tallow. Um, I, I typically cook in some combination of butter, tallow and lard. Okay. Amber, uh, one of the things we talk about is trying to get people to cook their own meals. Uh, was that something that worked for you in terms of getting more excited about your diet, improving your health? Because I do think that you need to like the process of improving your health and cooking is a simple way to do that. Uh, was that something that worked for you? Well, I'm laughing because of, I, you know, at the time in my life when I went carnivore, I had a a full house of children and uh, I was the main cook. So I was already doing all the cooking. But the fact is that cooking a carnivore meal is way, way easier than cooking even a low carb meal because vegetable prep takes so long. Mm. I mean, I will still cook uh, meals that include vegetables for my children if they want them. And I can remember one time I did it after not having done it for a while. It took 45 freaking minutes to cut up all the vegetables that I was going to saute. It was like, if, if this were just me, and I'd take a steak and put it on the pan, <laughs> come and turn it over once or twice, and then it's done. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think um, cooking for yourself is is super empowering. It's It's less expensive, definitely, than eating out. And you get to figure out how you like it best to the point where I think most people I know who cook for themselves go to a restaurant as a compromise because it's it's not as good as what they could make at home. It's less expensive and somebody does all the cleanup and you get to just hang out with your whoever you're there with and chat. And that's really nice, um, but it's, it's not better. <laughs> mm -hmm. Except for maybe a few restaurants that you probably wouldn't be going to every day anyway. Mm -hmm. Do you try and be pretty intentional about the restaurants that you will eat out at just with like the over prevalence of seed oils that a lot of these industrial kitchens are cooking with? 
I don't worry too much about seed oils, especially in the quantity that you'd be talking about for cooking mm. in. Although okay. I do have to say that a couple of times I've decided I was hungry while in an airport. And um, well, there's this one moment that sticks out in my mind because I decided I was going to have a burger. I was just, I needed a burger. Yeah. <laughs> and I ordered just a plain patty and it was sopping in seed oil and I could just oh. taste it and it, you know, a little bit to just um, fry on. I think it's not going to be that big a deal, but mm -hmm. this was this was disgusting. <laughs> um, Amber, are there any like books or studies, podcasts, movies, any sort of resources that you would want to point people to as they start to educate themselves on this way of eating? There's kind of. Um, not as many resources as I would like. And also I have to confess, I haven't read all of the recent books that have come out, so I can't say uh, yay or nay for sure, but I know that um, a lot of people have praised Dr. Baker's book, Dr. Saladino's book, Judy Cho has a book. Mm -hmm. um, there's a woman named Michelle Hearn who wrote a book that I also haven't read, but I have mm. a copy. Um, and it's not a pure carnivore book, but carnivore features pretty heavily in it because she has worked with a lot of people with anorexia and have found that a carnivore diet is really helping them as well. Hmm. That's great. My last question for you is what you, you touched on the cooking before. Do you have a favorite carnivore dish that you love to cook at home? Oh, so many. I, I really love beef ribs. Beef ribs. Um, great. Those choice. are the kind of thing that you, kind of have to cook a bit more. I love a just a plain old good burger as long as it's not overcooked, as I mentioned. I put a good sear on it. And yeah. um, so those are kind of simple things. Yeah. Simple you, that I like. Amber, will you allow yourself to have some cheese on the burger? Do you do you digest dairy particularly well? Yeah, I, I don't necessarily avoid dairy. I think okay. I do feel better if I don't eat it all the time, but it doesn't give me a problem in if I eat it from time to time. Amber, what's the best place for people to come into contact with some of the work that you're doing um, in terms of writing or, or just um, you know, putting good information out there? Mostly it's all on my website, although my blog posts are kind of uh, far between because they tend to get big and then takes me a long time to write them. I've also, I've been doing a lot of presentations over the last several years. Mm -hmm. And so the presentations often take up the time that I would have spent into writing a blog post. And I've mostly been collecting them on YouTube, but not all of them can be found on YouTube. So for example, um, a couple of uh, presentations that I really like of mine. One uh, recent about sleep that I did at Low Carb Boca and another one um, called Meat is Food, Plants are Medicine, which is all about um, phytochemicals and hormesis and how the body processes these different so-called bioactives. Both of those are hosted on Keto Mojo's site. Uh, I should put links to them in, on my website, actually. I, uh, my website, it, is a little bit behind on the media list. It's hard to keep up mm. with myself. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, but I know that there are a bunch of good presentations that you've done on YouTube. So we'll definitely, if, if you'd like, we could definitely link to the sleep one and then the meat is food, plant, plants or medicine in the show notes too. Sounds great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. This has been such a great conversation. And, uh, you know, hopefully whether it's at a conference or somewhere else, we'll actually get the opportunity to link up in person. I know you yeah. mentioned low carb Boca. We're going to the, we've had Doug Reynolds on and he, we're going to go to his, uh, his event out in San Diego, which is where I'm based. So I don't know if you're planning on attending that, but we'll be there. Very nice. I am not sure. My, the next two events that I'll be uh, at will be Keto Fest, which is in July oh, nice. and the Ancestral Health Symposium, which is one of my all time favorite conferences. And that's in August at UCLA. Oh, perfect. We'll have to, we'll have to, uh, to go to that. Cause that's not too far from where I'm, from where I'm based. I'm looking forward to meeting you. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Amber. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Amber.